thank you to the organizers for this opportunity to present some of our work. Um, so Joanne's group has, for the last few years, focused primarily on um, HIV transmission in adolescent or in women, and has tried to understand the relationship between STIs, BV, and genital tract inflammation and HIV risk. So it's been known for quite a while that STIs and BV increased risk of HIV susceptibility. Um, it's also been known that genital tract inflammation associated with these conditions is thought to be a significant contributor of increased HIV risk of acquisition. And as has been spoken about earlier today, the he healthy female genital tract is actually re presents a relatively safe and effective barrier uh, to HIV entry during sex. And so this is work from Chris Miller's group at UC Davis in 2005, where he gave a large inoculum of SHIV virus, 10 to the power of 11, um, into the general track of rhesus macaques and looked to see what happened. And you can see from the diagram on the bottom right-hand corner that a lot of the virus particles were trapped within the mucus and unable to cause infection. And the cross-section on the bottom left-hand side, what we can see is the uh, cross-section of the vagina, that despite the large inoculum, there are very few infected particles that are actually replicating. Um, Work done by Lindy Masson and company from Caprisa in 2012 to 2014 looked at the roles that uh, genital inflammation play in HIV risk. And what she did here was look at uh, cytokines as biomarkers of genital inflammation at women at pre-HIV acquisition time points. Um, and so looking at this heat map, what you can see if you, if you focus initially just on, on the row at the top, are the yellow and the blue squares, and these are 58 women who either remain HIV uninfected, and those are represented by the, the yellow squares, and women in blue who later became HIV infected. But again, I'd just like to point out that this is, this, these um, samples were taken pre-HIV infection. Uh, she looked at 12 different pro-inflammatory cytokines and kinokines, and what you can see is quite striking, is that it's a clustering of the women who became HIV infected with the red blocks, and those, are, those indicate increased levels of genital, infl genital tract inflammation amongst women who acqu later acquired HIV. To look at this data in another way, and so to look at a more binary representation, she classified women as either to have genital tract inflammation present or absent, and genital tract inflammation was, um, was classified as if you had more than 50% of your cytokines at the 75th centile or above. And so, looking at the data this way, you can get an odds ratio of 3.2, which was significant um, in those women who had inflammation on their risk for HIV acquisition later on. Um, so next, now that she knew that inflammation was, did seem to be a driver of HIV risk, she tried to figure out what the causes of inflammation was. And interestingly, in this cohort, only 20% of the HIV infections were thought to be attributable to um, sexually transmitted infections with T. vaginalis being the most strongly predictive uh, marker of genital tract inflammation. But it's important to note that in this study, uh, Newton scoring was not done, so we don't know the uh, BB status of, of the woman in this study. Further collaboration was done with Ian Lipkin and Brent Williams at Columbia University, and they did 16S micro, uh, 16X sequencing of the micro vaginal microbiome samples. And again, if you uh, looking at this heat map, I draw your attention to the bottom two rows. The second last row is HIV status, with the red squares being those women that uh, seroconverted, and the gray squares those women that didn't convert, and the bottom row shows uh, classes of genital cy cytokine inflammation. So the, green, the two greens are squares that have low inflammation, and the orange squares are those women with high levels of inflammation. And what's, what's uh, seen here is those women who had high levels of genital tract inflammation was associated with an increased diversity amongst the organisms that were seen, as opposed to those women with low levels of inflammation had higher levels of lactobacillus innocent and lactobacillus crispatus. Um, the most, sorry, the most important um, correlation that was seen in the study was if you looked at this group here, the women who had, who were both HIV, who still converted to become HIV infected and had high levels of inflammation, were associated with Prevotella and Snedia organisms that have been previously been shown to have been associated with bacterial vaginosis. Brent went on to do some modeling work, and what he did um, was look at the relationship initially between HIV seroconversion and HC stands for high levels of cytokines. So and what he saw was that in those women with high level, uh, that in those women who seroconverted, the uh, adjusted odds ratio was 9.1 amongst those women who had high levels of, of um, genital tract inflammation. And then in his second model, he looked at the organisms most likely associated with high levels of cytokine inflammation in this, 
again, was Prevotella bivia. And so in this final model, he looked and tied the data up quite nicely, was the relationship between Prevotella bivia and seroconversion. And you can see the adjusted odds ratio was 12.7, and this was significant. So from this Caprice study, which was done primarily in a cohort from Durban, um, with the co collaboration of Slim and Croatia Abdul Karim, what we saw was a very high incidence of STIs and BBs. And both of these conditions were associated with inflammation. And importantly, they were associated with inflammation even if these conditions remained asymptomatic. But what we were interested in is in different parts of South Africa, would this uh, hold true and would the severity of inflammation be different depending on the population you looked at? And so the next uh, study I'm going to talk about was an EDCTP funded strategic prime award, which was run between November 2013 and May 2015. And in this study, we enrolled 288 young women who were all HIV negative between the ages of 16 and 22. And they were enrolled in two sites. 149 were enrolled in Linda Gelb Becker's site at, um, in Desmond Tutu in Matipal Malele. And the other 149 were enrolled in Glenda Gray's site in Soweto at the PHRU. The women from Cape Town were seen longitudinally for three visits, depending on the uh, uh, contraception type. They were either seen either two monthly or three monthly and those women from um, Soweto were seen once. And at each visit, they had, they had a comprehensive uh, panel done looking for STIs, including gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, mycoplasma, herpes, HPV, and syphilis. Um, Nugent scoring was done to look at the, the BV stasis. Um, Heather Jaspin did 16S microbiome, and we collected um, cytokines from soft cups to look at 47 different cytokines and chemokines. And finally, Smitty W sitting at the back of the, uh, the audience that um, looked at T-cell activation from the cytobrush. So the first paper which described this cohort was published last year in SCD and AIDS. And what we can see is this is a fairly typical cohort to find in South Africa. The median age of sexual debut was 16 years. Lifetime number of sexual partners was two. And despite the fact that this cohort is quite young, about 25% had already had at least one pregnancy. Condom use was not great. Only 30% reported condom use um, always. However, when you asked about condom use in the last sex act, these numbers improved to over 80%. So we went on to look at the prevalence of STIs amongst the different age groups, even though the age, group, the, um, age groups were quite narrow. And what we saw was a high prevalence of STIs, particularly in chlamydia and the younger age group, so those aged 16 to 17. We went on to do MLST um, typing of the chlamydia sequence types, and we found 34 different sequence types, 15 of which were novel to the study. Um, interestingly, in this group, bacterial vaginosis was shown to be the most inflammatory condition, so much more inflammatory than trichomonas, chlamydia, or gonorrhea. And when we looked at the five different classes, so the inflammatory cytokines, the chemokines, growth factors, adaptive cytokines, and regulatory cytokines, BV increased um, uh, different cytokines in all these different classes. However, when we looked a bit more closely at the chemokines, we found two of them, MIG and IP10, were significantly downregulated in the presence of bacterial vaginosis. So we wanted to see if there's a difference in the inflammatory signature that was seen between Cape Town and Johannesburg. And what you can see from the, the graph on the right-hand side is that the woman from Soweto, uh, the woman from Masipimilele, had generally higher levels of inflammation across all four functional classes However, looking at the, the chemokines, what we can see is significant downregulation of the site of, of chemokines was a lot more marked in Matsipimulele and Cape Town than in comparison to Soweto. Then Heather Jaspin, Katie Leonard, and Smirti went on to look at the microbial composition and how this related to genital tract inflammation. So we had data from Durban, now we want to see whether, what the data from Cape Town and Johannesburg was like. And what they saw confirmed that what Brent and Ian Lipkin had, had seen that, in fact, bacterial vaginosis was significantly associated with the presence of high levels of inflammation. And particularly, the subtype that had previously been described that was associated with Prevotella was, had an odds ratio of over 11 to be associated with high levels of genital tract inflammation. Next, um, looking at this heat map, and again, looking at the top row, we have levels of, um, high levels of inflammation are the orange bars, and low levels of inflammation will be the green bars. And again, you can see, looking at Prevotella and Gardnerella, there's a relatively high abundance in, in these uh, women with high levels of inflammation with both these organisms. Um, then looking at the graph on the, on the right-hand side, and this is uh, meant to predict levels of low inflammation. And you can see there's a relationship between um, non-BB organisms and low levels of inflammation. However, when you look at Gardnerella, again, 
God nearly does not predict low levels of inflammation in this, in this cohort. Finally, to look at the individual cytokines and um, the, the individual organism that were, what were, and what was seen is that there were the organisms on the right hand side. So the blue bars are, in, the blue spots indicate high levels of inflammation. And so there was a positive association with lots of the BV associated organisms Megasperia, Shuttlewellia, Atopobium, Prevotella, Snedia, and Bacteroides with high levels of inflammation. However, uh, organisms such as Coronibacterium, Peptosoccus, and Morganella were associated with low levels of inflammation. And just to draw your attention once more to Privatella, we can see this is strongly associated with high levels of inflammation in these pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Um, next, work to show you some work done by Christine Baller and uh, Heather Jaspin, and they looked at the relationship between BV and chlamydia. And so, again, looking at the heat map on the left-hand side, what you can see is the, the, the girls on the left-hand side with the green is a, a chlamydia positive, and the blue are the chlamydia negative. And there's an association with increased diversity with those girls who had chlamydia. And then if you look at the principal coordinate analysis on the right-hand side, there's a relationship between, again, with being chlamydia positive and either having a diverse anaerobic bacteria or having a predominantly LN as microbiome. Finally, uh, Smitty is going to, look, uh, going to look at the reasons. So we know that there seems to be an association between HIV acquisition and um, genital tract inflammation. We think a lot of this is driven either by STIs or BV. And to try to get a better idea of the mechanism behind this, we looked at T-cell activation. And so the markers we looked at were those CD4 positive uh, T-cells that were both CDH and HLDR positive. So looking at the middle column, what you can see is those women who had high levels of activation, so those CD4 T cells that were CD838 and HLDR positive, were associated with high levels of chemokines and, um, and pro-inflammatory cytokines. We then went on to look at, so growing your attention to the column on the left-hand side, those cells that were CD4 and CCR5 positive, expecting to see a similar relationship, and however, this was not present. However, when we looked at a subset of these such cells, so those CD4, CCR5 positive cells, that were highly activated, so that were CD38, HLDR positive, we see this relationship continues so with high levels of uh, activation associated with inflammation and um, high levels of um, chemokines. Finally, um, we looked at if this relationship was true for bacterial vaginosis. So uh, the graph on the left-hand side has got CD4 T cells on the right, CD8 T cells. And so the women are divided up into three groups. There's BV negative, BV intermediate, so a uh, Newton score between four and six, and BV positive, so a score of seven to 10. And we see a significant difference and an increase in the CD positive, again, the activated CD38 HLDR positive cells, and those women who are uh, BV positive in comparison to those women who are BV negative. So in conclusion, what we see is different pieces of the puzzle seem to be falling in place. We seem to see a relationship between genital inflammation and HIV risk and a relationship between genital inflammation and, and cellular activation. And we think that changes in the microbiome, including bacterial vaginosis and STIs, tend to play a role in both the um, inflammation, cellular activation, and thus increasing HIV risk. So finally, what I'd like to do is to acknowledge the funders, the NIH for Joanne's R01 and EDTCP for the Strategic Primer Award, um, the group at UCT, including, of course, Joanne, Heather, Smithy, and Katie Leonard, who've worked very hard on the study, our EDCTP uh, collaborators, particularly Linda Gelbecker and Glenda Grace, whose sites we did the study at, which um, Tom Hope, Francesca Ciodi, Robin Shattock as our uh, 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 international collaborators, and Slim and Croatia Kareem for allowing us to use their site at Caprisa. Thank you very much for your attention.